So I reached out uh, broadly on Twitter for people to, to speak with about really any range of assorted topics, mostly economics, but it, you know, it could be political too. Uh, and you reached out and wanted to speak broadly about capitalism and socialism and the preferences between the two systems. So you're a socialist. And so why, how about you uh, tell me why you're a socialist? Sure. So I differ, I think, a lot from a lot of socialists, or at least traditional Marxists. Sure. Um, for me, it's more so about less so some kind of like issue with equality or inequality, those sorts of things, or a kind of a more efficient system. It's more so just a matter of uh, freedom and reaching a more, I guess you say, more genuine or realizable form of freedom. freedom. In the current one you think about, yes. Okay, so how does how does your version of socialism walk me through your version of socialism and and tell me how does it maximize, you know, how does it optimize a person's individual freedom? Okay, so there's a couple of things. So when we talk about freedom, we have to differentiate what we're talking about when we mean it. So when I talk about freedom, I don't mean just like um the sort of standard conception of I can do more things, I have more choices in like what I can do. Um, so the way I think about it is under our current system, our conceptualization of freedom might be something like, you know, being able to have more say um, or having more political rights. But also it could also mean having more choices when it comes to like what you can buy or sell. And what I say is I don't think, you know, having choices in what you can own or what you can buy or sell, the sort of consumeristic mindset is really a genuine conception of freedom. I think it's a more shallow understanding. So for me. When I talk about freedom, what I'm talking about is a freedom that is free of coercion or a freedom that is free of more, you know, I guess you could say oppressing forces so that you can pursue a more free society. And so with that in mind, you know, it's hard for me to conceptualize a, some like exact system that sure. captures this perfectly. But I'll tell you, generally speaking, um, the ways in which this freedom is currently curtailed or else i guess you say dampered um under the current system and i guess we, i can go from there if you want but i'm not sure if you're following me so far i am following you i think um you know i've talked about this before and i feel like capitalism uh doesn't necessarily uh have coercion baked into it um, I don't think that, uh, you know, I think that you can have a capitalist system with uh, either equal or less coercion than a socialist system. Uh, and I think that it's valuable to strive towards that system versus a socialist system because it is proven to work and there are structural issues with socialism in socialist economies that I feel like cannot be uh, resolved. They're internal and incons- well, um, I don't want to say internal contradictions, but there's um, there's structural issues with socialism that I don't think can be resolved, and I think it would hurt quality of living and, and, and growth uh, broadly. So that's why I would prefer more of a managed, you know, regulated capitalist type system versus a socialist one. Yeah, and I guess I, the main contention here is I don't think that there's... I guess I'd ask you what you think those contradictions in socialism are, but also I would ask you, you know, the kinds of measurements you're using and how you're choosing to evaluate these systems. Um, because I think, you know, there isn't such a thing as sort of this objective sort of empirical look at these systems. And ultimately, when we're valuing a system, it's always going to come down to a moral um, set of values, principles, preferences, whatever you want to call it. And so when we assess the system, we're going off those moral values, and that's what we're projecting onto them. So I would I would say that, well, two things. I would ask you what those contradictions for socialism are that you're talking about, but also more broadly, how you're going about assessing those contradictions or issues that you see. Sure. So I think I think this is why I asked more specifically what your socialist system would look like, because it would depend on the system. Um, I think that the flavor of the day is uh, market socialism, I would say. Mm-hmm. And I would say that the issues with those systems are that um, you end up with a lot of structural uh, 
unemployment, it becomes a lot more expensive to hire. Uh, it does become, it is possible to, but it does become harder to scale. Uh, and some industries really benefit from scale. Uh, I think that capital, uh, capital funding and liquidity are real problems in market socialist systems uh, because when workers are the owners of the means of production, uh, they, uh, you know, naturally they own an equity in a company. Uh, and so I think that they're going to, you know, there's, there's going to be, there's not really as much of a such thing as like, you know, public uh, ownership in the sense uh, of like the stock market, you know, raising capital, things like that. Um, I think that uh, investment becomes a big problem. Uh, credit scores all of a sudden become tied to your actual employment, which I think would hurt uh, a lot of people. Um, if you take it into an American context, I think that would specifically uh, prevent a lot of uh, uh, you know lower income people from getting jobs because oftentimes they have poor credit scores. And so I think there's a lot of things baked into uh, inherent in any financial system, whether socialist or capitalist, uh, that uh, you know doesn't really work out in a market socialist framework. But what I would say is that in terms of representative rights, in terms of political rights, in terms of individual freedom and collective freedom, uh, you can accomplish all of those things under a capitalist framework. And I would argue that under that framework, you would have more freedom uh, than you would under a socialist framework. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things here again. So, I mean, I don't want to sound like this, but I think you're you're projecting issues or certain concepts of capitalism onto a socialist system. Like I think you brought up credit scores and sort of equity. And while, you know, market socialism, I think is preferable, it's not the system uh, I would necessarily advocate for in and of itself. Um, because a lot of the issues we're talking about, you know, come from a mindset that we're, you know, applying what currently exists now to what, exists in the future and simply put you know i don't think that's necessarily the most uh, i guess it's a productive way of thinking about it because when we're talking about socialism we're not talking about capitalism but retweaked and we're we have like we give workers like stocks or whatever that's not really what socialism is socialism is more is a bit more profound than that or a profound it's a little pretentious i don't know what the right word is it's a bit more than that um it's more so that we're returning the means of production. And you might think that is just through equity, or you might think that's just through a stock, but more so it's that workers actually have the ability and control over their lives, over their businesses, which sounds abstract, but I think you can actually think about it in more concrete terms. Um, and I'm sure you've, you've heard all this stuff before, but essentially, you know, what I'm trying to get at is that it's not so much that you can project to what you currently see now to what could be. Um, yeah, I kind of lost where I was going with that. What else? Oh, sorry, what else did you say? Well, yeah, I think this is one of the. I think this is one of the problems. That's why often with these debates, I try to start out with you know what your flavor of socialism is because you know you're speaking yeah. in vagaries, and I think that it's not um, it's not purposeful on your point. I'm not trying to say that you're obfuscating, but what I am trying to say is that I think when you speak in vagaries, you inadvertently or advertently, uh, you know, sort of hand wave a lot of the very specific details of a broad system of economics. You know, I, I think, you know, socialism is deeper than economics. Well, I don't, I don't really think it is. I mean, socialism is an economic system and, you know, economics, uh, you know, we can analyze the economics of, uh, the mercantilist economy, despite the fact that it wasn't broadly capitalist, right? We can we can analyze uh, the economics of, you know, the Soviet Union from an internal standpoint, despite that it the fact that it was largely decommodified, that it was a centrally planned economy for the most part. So I mean, you know, I economics is you know uh, the science of the distribution of scarce resources. So it doesn't really have to be. Uh, you know, you say it's it's a it's a capitalist framing to talk about credit scores or talk about equity ownership. I mean, it's really just a framing of um, how you know virtually any financial or economic system would uh, would likely need to run. Um, if you talk to me about a world without credit scores, there's a lot of other problems. Uh, if you talk to me, uh, you know, in a it, to a world without equity ownership, there's a lot of other problems with that as well. So, I mean, you you know, a lot of the hand waves just end up snowballing into bigger and bigger problems for your system.
Okay, so there's a few things there again. So you say basically that socialism is just an economic system. Basically, I'm correct about that. That that's your understanding of it. But like for me, as I've said before, I think it's more than that. I think it's a it's like a moral position, and you can prescribe more to socialism than it just being an economic arrangement. Um, you know, it's the same thing. Like the way I think about it is when we talk about something like veganism, you know, we can talk about you know issues relating to diets or you know environmental concerns. But ultimately, when we're talking about something like veganism, we're talking about a concern, a moral concern with sentient life. In this same way, when we talk about socialism, we're not just talking about an economic arrangement. We're talking about, you know, a basically the autonomy and the sort of freedom or rights that we give to workers and their ability to, you know, self-determine for themselves on what they want. And simply put, under capitalism, so long as so basically capitalism, from my understanding, from the way I think about it, is it's it perpetuates and it necessitates an underclass of people. And that underclass is subservient to that dominant class. And so because of this, you know, I guess you could say relationship, it necessitates that there shall always be someone to be oppressed upon or someone to be exploited for for whatever purposes, namely profit. But the point being is that in such a system, you cannot expect, you know, a truly free society. In the same way, you cannot expect a society that still, you know, has and treats animals, you know, as food or, you know, as ends and of themselves. Even if people treat their animals nicely, you know, they take them for walks, they feed them, you know, they give them room. If at the end of the day, those animals are still ultimately used to be exploited and, you know, ultimately killed, that doesn't make an ethical or moral system. It just makes a slightly more preferable system. So I would say to you that, you know, if even if we look to like the Nordic model or you know, any kind of social democratic country in Europe, while that is preferable to what we have here in the United States, it ultimately isn't a moral ethical arrangement because it's still, you know, propositioned um, on this on this relationship, I guess you could say. Well, sure, I, I understand that. But again, this is where uh, the vagary of your specific system kind of comes into play again, because, you know, in, unless you're talking about a very theoretical, um, I would argue, relatively impossible system to implement, uh, you know, there's not going to be a total horizontal distribution of power in uh, a socialist system, right? Even in a, you know, in a market system. Well, right, but you're talking about, you're saying capitalism necessitates inequality, necessitates, you know, class deviations of people, but socialism mm -hmm. does the same thing. Now, you might argue, um, for instance, I think uh, in my conversation with Socialism Done Left, he mentioned that, uh, well, socialism has a lot less inequality. It's like, okay, well, fair enough, but if the value, you know, if you're, if you're making the statement that um, I just value a classless sort of equal society, right, that's what I'm going for. Well, socialism doesn't get you there. Right. And I think that what gets you there Absolutely. better, well, I think what gets you to, uh, you know, essentially a more equal society rather is uh, just, you know, a capitalist system where you have reasonable worker representation, unionization and an equitable tax system. And that's been proven to work. You know, I mean, we can criticize the Nordic economies, um, but the reality is they're, um, you know, that's a free market private economy that uh, is uh, very, very equal on the in the grand scheme of things. So I think. Uh, that's really the the model we would uh, strive for. It seems like every time socialism uh, has been attempted, there's been uh, either or uh, a lot of political unrest uh, and or a uh, a lot of economic instability uh, that ultimately leads to either the country's downfall or transition away from the system in favor of more uh, market reforms. Yeah. So I mean, when we're talking about something like the Nordic model as kind of the um... I guess the go-to or the ideal. Um, I think once again we're coming to the question of what are we what are we measuring when it comes to an egalitarian society, or what are we measuring when it comes to equality? Because I would argue, while in some ways those systems have done a good job, um, the problems with it necessitate that there's always going to be underlying issues that make it both insus unsustainable, but also 
conditional. So what do I mean by this? Well, it's unsustainable in the sense that, you know, the Nordic model, you know, social democratic countries in Europe, the problems with them is that these kind these kinds of models are not you can't implement them in something like the third world because they're propositioned on certain realities, those realities being imperialism, but also being the kind of, I guess you call it, investment in relationships with the United States. So European countries, I mean, I don't think this is new, like new news or anything, but you no, know, the reason they have the kinds of wealth they have is not simply because they are inherently better countries or that, you know, they just trade good or whatever. It's because they've exploited the third world, they exploited countries like Africa for their resources and wealth. And this wealth has been concentrated in such a way where they're able to create the kinds of welfare states that they have created and thus have, you know, brought about the kinds of, you know, social democratic reforms that they have. And even countries like Scandinavia, you know, Norway, Sweden, even if they didn't directly have colonies, they have benefited tremendously from this relationship by being able to trade with these countries and be in the same sort of proximity of these countries where that wealth can overflow. So that's the one thing. But it's also it's also conditional. You know, when we look to countries like Germany, for instance, you know, after the Second World War, the reasons they were able to come about and create the robust economy that they have to come about with these social democratic reforms is due to massive investments from the United States via the Marshall Plan. So these realities are very contingent on certain, um, you know, historical trends. It's based on certain material conditions. So these systems cannot be just implemented anywhere. They're based on certain things, certain kinds of exploitation, certain kinds of other actors. So when we talk about these systems and how, you know, they're more free or what have you, um, Free in what way? Free in what sense? Because to me, I don't think a system that is conditional upon other nations and also has only got there, or maybe mostly got there due to exploiting other nations, is really that free of society. And lastly, I, I would have to know like what measurements you mean by more egalitarian, because I think that's going to be the crux of what our problems are in this. Yeah, sure. So I think that it's, you know, it's a little ironic. Uh what you've brought up here uh, in, in a certain sense. So, you know, on one hand, we're saying that the wealth of Northern, you know, the global North is based on the exploitation of the global South, which I think in part is correct. There's probably some percentage of uh, GDP uh, that, that you, you know, or total wealth creation that's based on exploitation. It's, it's hard to determine those numbers. And I think that's why socialists mention it a lot that it's, you know, I'm not sure if it's like 80% of the, you know, living standard of, of the global north is based on exploitation of global south, but it's probably some percentage, I'll grant you. Um, and while at the same time you're saying that's necessary, that there has to be exploitation, you also mentioned um, the Marshall Plan, right? Which was, you know, you're saying one of the reasons that uh, the European economy has survived was because the Marshall Plan existed. Well, the Marshall Plan was, you know, I looked it up just now, it was about $100 billion. I've never put a, a dollar amount in my head to the Marshall Plan, but it was about a hundred billion dollars worth of today's money going to Europe, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, we spent like five trillion dollars stimulating the economy. So I think the prospect of a capitalist economy uh, sending money uh, over to countries in order to help them develop is is a perfectly reasonable expectation. I, I don't think that that cannot happen in a capitalist framework. Like you've mentioned, it's already happened under a capitalist framework when we sent a hundred billion dollars over to Europe. For them to rebuild after World War II, so you know, I, I don't think that that would be. In, well, my let me point, let, let me okay. let me finish really quick. One one more second. So, okay. um, so I don't think that that would be impossible. And I, I think also today, when you look at the actual percentage of the global North economy today that's reliant on imports uh, or trade, economic activity from the global South, it's not actually that much. You know, we're talking between three and five percent of GDP across the global North that's based on trade with the global South. Uh, that is certainly something that can be uh, reformed. But what I would say also is that you don't necessarily want less trade with the global South. Rather, what you want rather is just a more equitable trade system, and that's something that uh, can certainly uh, be accomplished in a capitalist framework. It's been accomplished before. Yeah, sorry for interrupting. My point was when I was trying to cut in there was that my point wasn't that. You know, 
having other capitalist countries invest in other capitalist countries is, you know, couldn't happen in a capitalist framework. My point is that these social democratic countries, they aren't, they aren't coming about on their own merits as other capitalist countries are. So it's not like, you know, it just emerges and that this is the best system. It's emergent because we have allowed it to emerge. We've allowed it to emerge through our investment. So the Marshall Plan is demonstrative of the fact that these systems aren't necessarily just solely better than all the other systems. They just work better. They work because we have allowed them to work. They work because we invest so much money into them that they can survive. You know, well, so that's my main didn't... point. Capitalism didn't sprout out of the ground. I mean, it had to start somewhere sure. when it was when it was a minority system, uh, and it grew because it was very successful. Um, and you know, I, I guess unfortunately for your Why case, the same the, metric, can I not say that in some ways that's the same as socialism, right? Because well, socialism, ways, every time it's so, been tried, it's failed. It hasn't been sustainable. In every what time way? It's been tried. This, is, this is the this is the issue. What way do you mean has it failed or not succeed? It doesn't last. You know, it hasn't lasted today. Like, what? What are you talking about? I'm not really sure. Well, again, this is this is when it comes back to my point. When it it depends on your flavor of socialism. Now, uh, there have yep. been there have been uh, I I would say that there there's probably two functional, uh, real, arguable versions of socialism, right? So there, I I wouldn't count. Some people would call um like Rich, Richard Wolf, for instance. He would sometimes he would label like social democracy as a type of socialism, which I don't think most people would agree with mm -hmm. today, but um, mm -hmm. I would say a market socialist system and a more centrally planned system or a mix of the two would kind of be the spectrum of, of like modern implementation of socialism. There've been market socialist systems that have been tried before. They struggled with the exact same things that I just mentioned. Um, and there have been centrally planned systems that have existed uh, and they've also struggled uh, very deeply. Um, I think that, well, uh, to be fair though, I think uh, arguably state capitalism could, I think state capitalism could arguably be a form of, of socialism, ironically enough. It would depend on who I'm talking to in that regard. But um, if, you know, if we're not counting China as socialism, um, there's really not been uh, examples of uh, successful forms of uh, of socialism. And at the very least, I would say that there hasn't been, ex even if you count China as a socialist system, there haven't been successful examples of socialism implemented that maintain any sort of democratic structure. Um, they they seem to devolve into authoritarianism rather quickly. And I, I think that that's uh, pr probably counter to your goal of maximizing uh, individual or collective freedom. Yeah, so, I mean... I don't want to be rude, but you keep you're accusing me of vagaries, and you kind of engage in the same thing. But because we're well, talking, I can I can mention several examples if you want. I mean, you know, we we can talk about yeah, Cuba, too, Vietnam, yeah. China that all devolved into authoritarianism. Soviet Union that did the same thing and eventually sure. collapsed. Yugoslavia that uh, was a market socialist system but struggled with inflation and unemployment and private investment, or well, I should say capital raising. In in the case of a market socialist system, and they eventually yeah. collapsed as well. So I mean. You know, Chile, for instance, struggled deeply with socialism even before the coup. Um, you know, the Pinochet government, I, I, it didn't have a sustainable economic model either. So, Wait, you know, you it, think... okay. Venezuela, for instance, would be another instance of, uh, you know, arguably socialism failing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, and, and devolving into authoritarianism. So, you know, specific so examples. Your, so your criteria is authoritarianism and whether or not they are... I guess economically sustainable. Is that what you mean by failures? Then, yeah, I would say that a system is a is a is a failure, uh, or the government, the system of government, is a failure if it does not deliver services to the people, if it is not sustainable in the sense that it's uh it's internally stable, um, in the sense that it doesn't have strong institutions, um, very basic um sort of definitions of what makes a state. You know, having strong institutions that are credible, that are deliverable. Um, that maintains some quality of life uh, for its people uh, for, uh, you know, an extended period of time. Uh, and I do think that there are, there are systems around today that call themselves socialists, uh, but uh, really aren't in, a, in actual practical implementation. They're more just authoritarian systems. Um, I think the closest, I think really the closest thing to socialism today that is around is probably Cuba. Um, 
but I think Cuba also has a lot of internal economic problems that we can't just blame all on the United States. So I, you know, there's a lot of problems it seems when socialism is in. Sure. I mean, I'll say there certainly can be problems, but well, I'll say that you know, when it comes to authoritarianism, I don't think that's a uniquely socialist problem. For one, I mean, I'm not saying that you're saying that, but that's kind of the framing I was getting from that. So. Sorry if I'm misinterpreting you, because, I mean, if we want to talk about, you know, a country that by all metrics is a very successful and is also capitalist, we can also just point to something like Singapore, right? And that is a incredibly authoritarian country. So I don't think this issue of authoritarianism is unique um, and more so to the point, I guess. Um, sorry, well, Singapore, well, what I would say is that that you're right. That's one criteria. Uh, why collect your thoughts? That's one criteria. Yes. Um, but you have to keep in mind that Sing you know Singapore they do have elections. Um, they have high turnout in those elections. Now there are, um, it's certainly I don't okay. think it's quite arguable that Singapore is a totally free and fair uh, democracy because it's not. It's not. It's more of like a not an it's not as bad as an Iranian sort of style democracy, but it's it's farther to the democracy spectrum than Iran is. But you know, at the same time, people do vote and participate. Uh, but uh, you know. At the same time, the other quality metrics, you know, maintaining a quality of life for its citizens, um, I, I think uh, having strong, incredible institutions. I mean, Singapore seems to do that uh, quite well. So, I, you know, I, not to defend their uh, political system to any degree, but, you know, there's there's multiple metrics. You know, for instance, if, if uh, you know, uh, I don't know what you'd score on this scale, but if a system was like uh, just a total supreme leader dictatorship, but at the same time, everyone was basically happy with their life and everyone had a really high quality of living, you know, maybe it gets a, you know, maybe it gets a 60% on the test or something, you know, I don't know, but there's a, there's a, there's an equation you have to come up with in your head to determine like the efficacy of a political system. And what I'm just saying is that socialism does not seem to accomplish your goal of maximizing individual freedom uh, or collective freedom in, in practice. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to really talk about specific examples because whenever we talk about specific examples, we're going to come up with counter examples. You know, I can, for every example you talk about socialism, I can just point to another country that's capitalist and say. Well, but uh, what I think, what I think that you can't do though is like you can't do what I can do, which is point to many, many successful examples of socialist countries. I can point to many, 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 you know, hundreds of, of successful. Uh, examples of, of capitalist countries. And I think that's a real problem when you're advocating for a political system that, when tried, seems to uh, perpetually fail. Okay. Well, my point... Okay. So if we're going by this, you know, could it not be said 500 years ago? 700 years ago. You know, if we went back to feudalist times, you know, they could say the same thing. What do you mean capitalism? There hasn't been a successful capitalist project. There are all these weird revolutions that happen for liberalism or what have you, and they get crushed. You know, it doesn't seem very sustainable or successful. Let's just stick to feudalism. So, like, I'm not going to engage with this because if we can apply the same logic, then I don't think that's a very valid argument to say just because it hasn't worked so far doesn't mean that it's not conceivable that we could have a system like that. Right? You know what I'm saying? I think I would disagree because there have been natural experiments and natural examples of capitalism cropping up on its own, and those have also been successful. I mean, for instance, the 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 origin of the Chinese market reforms was a natural origin. It was farmers disregarding the central planning authority uh, and keeping the means of their own productions to themselves and keeping the fruits of their labor to themselves. And what the Chinese authority found. Uh, was that they were actually much more productive when they were able to privately cultivate their agriculture rather than having these uh, commune systems that the Chinese government implemented. And and so, you know, I, I think that the fact that private organization has shown to, you know, essentially naturally cramp up and uh, sort of indirectly, directly, whatever, uh, be better than a, either a centrally planned or a market socialist system, China tried both, uh, I, I think is, is a hell of a lot of evidence that my system is more innate uh it's it's uh it's effective provably um whereas again it does seem that uh whenever socialism crops up uh it's often on the back of a lot of angry fervor um even if it if you could argue it crops up naturally it does seem to be unsustainable doesn't seem to be stable 
Uh, and like I said, at the very, very, very least, it has a hell of a problem with scaling um, that can theoretically be addressed, uh, but hasn't been practically addressed in any of the examples. So I think that that's the difference between, you know, going a thousand years ago and talking about capitalism's impossible. Well, capitalism sprouted up naturally and it's been able to sustain itself throughout, you know, the last 500 years or something like that. However, you know, argue whenever capitalism started, but, you know, it's 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 quite a tried and true tested system, whereas socialism for the last 150, 200 years has been, uh, you know, a, a tried and tested and, and uh, robust failure. But I think it's important for you to engage in those examples, at least because uh, uh, I think that they're they're devastating to your point, and, and so it's probably worth you uh, engaging in those uh, examples. My um, point is that we can't, it's not that we can't learn from them. My point is that just looking to examples and saying, oh, I guess it can't work, I don't think it's a very fair assessment of this the reason i was bringing up these sort of feudalist examples is because if we went you know all those years ago there wouldn't be an example of a successful capitalist project because they all either failed or they were crushed so by the same logic i don't think it's a fair assessment just look at the failed examples and not go hmm, how can we learn from this but instead go oh, you see this isn't a failure there's nothing to this let's just move on the point is that yes we can look at these systems we can look at these failed experiments if you want to call them that and we can learn from them and understand how you can improve from them. But to simply just go, ah, well, it's a failure. Let's move on. I don't think it's a fair assessment. So that's generally how I come at it. Um, but, you know, like I said before, I don't think it's a very productive use of our time just to go back and forth with examples. Like, well, sure. Me, here's here's what I would say then. I think let's, let's, let's move on from that then. And let's say I think you can improve from those systems by implementing what I'm talking about, which is a social democratic, more regulated, a uh, capitalist society. I feel like I've addressed the inequality argument, you know, the idea that it necessitates a uh, class structure in society. I think socialism does the same thing. Um, but what capitalism does do very well, which I would love to hear you to respond to, is um, it effectively uh, has shown to be able to grow the economy, um, give you a strong tax base to tax from and redistribute from, uh, and uh, uh, capitalism has proven to be compatible uh, with generally liberal democracy uh, and uh, allow people representative voice in their government, which socialism hasn't uh, proven to be able to do. So how do you answer those things? I feel like capitalism, uh, regulated capitalism is the answer to failed socialism uh, as well as the answer to unequal capitalism. Okay. Um, I could do those, but I have to go point by point. So can you tell me your first point then? So my first point was that I feel like capitalism Social democratic, you know, sort of regulated capitalism is the answer to failed socialism in the sense that it gives you growth, it gives you a broad tax base that you can redistribute from, and in conjunction with that point, capitalism has proven to be uh, reconcilable, to be amicable to a democratic framework that uh, capitalist systems have proven to be able to coexist with a dem democratic framework of government, uh, which I feel maximizes our individual and collective liberties okay so your main points are growth was the second one creating a tax base your third one was political rights and i guess protecting liberal democracy and your last one sure. is what exactly those okay. are pretty much the three main points okay so for growth i don't contest that capitalism is great for growth i think marx even agreed to this so i'm not going to disagree with you that capitalism is great for growth sure believe so. I mean, I believe Marx has contended that, yes, capitalism is very good at growing the economy. He did, yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing. Because he his, oh, his okay. view was that you had to have capitalism to generate the wealth necessary to transition yeah. to socialism, which eventually would yes, transition sir. you to communism. Sorry, I was just confused by your saying yes, dude, but yeah, okay. So we agree on that. Uh, to your second point, in terms of creating a broad tax base, um, I guess so. Um, for me, that's not really the qualifier for what makes a successful or sustainable system you know in theory if we could you know create a limited tax system and just have more so you know more i guess autonomous decentralized whatever you want to call it that would work just fine in terms of the question on political freedoms and i guess um liberal democracy more broadly so looking to the examples that we usually look to in terms of you know like you know soviet union so on so on I agree with you. You know, I think those kinds of freedoms have been curtailed, and that is a problem. Um, but what I will say, more broadly, is that, you know, 
I don't think liberal democracy is necessarily the truest form of democracy. So I wouldn't, while I think it's better than authoritarianism, I would also seek to create something more than that. So, you know, when we think about liberal democracy, there are certain constraints that are always going to exist. And I think these constraints are inherently tied to capital and its existence. So what do I mean by this? Well, I mean by this in a few ways. When we talk about, you know, someone's representation in a democracy, someone's ability to act, workers don't have the same kinds of political or at least economic, I'll say economic power as capital does. And so capital will have certain influence over those in power, right? I mean, the most obvious example is with, you know, campaign finance and lobbying, those sorts of things. But this goes more deeply and more fundamentally to just, you know, how class interests work and how those with more power, more economic power are going to influence those with political power through numerous other avenues. I'm sure we can go down them if you wanted to, but those would be my, I guess, my main answers, I suppose. Sure. So I think um, we can move past the growth point since you've kind of agreed with it. Um, the point on the tax base was that uh, the type of redistribution that often market socialist systems or uh, even uh, I think I think most market social systems would have some component of central planning or decommodification from the state. But um, or, you know, central planning, I'll, I'll kind of sidestep central planning because I think you get into this weird argument of like, um, Technically, a lot of centrally planned economies didn't have a lot of taxes, but that was because they just, you know, they planned everything, so they sold their their products for a profit. So they, that's how they got their money for the state. But um, uh, to move on to the third point, I think that in terms of, you know, liberal democratic frameworks and the influence of capital in our democracy, you know, I agree. I, I think to a certain extent, you're right that capital has an outsized influence on our democracy. But when you look at broad trends over time, uh, look at the past hundred years, you know, the economy has become more and more redistributed by the government. Um, I think that uh, if you look at the proportion of the economy that is collected uh, in tax revenue, it's gone from like 15 or 20 percent in the early 1900s to uh, 35 or 40 percent today. And in like the Nordic economies, it's it's well above 40 percent, even sometimes reaching 50 percent. You know, majority of the economy is taxed and redistributed based on taxes that depends on the year to be fair that 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 hasn't been a sustainable thing but um you can even uh, oftentimes people will mention places like norway where uh, a majority of the uh total wealth of the nation is actually owned uh by the uh, the state and and conversely by the people so you know i think that what is true is, is what i said before is that it is proven that it is possible, uh, and I would say even in an American framework, it is it is is very well compatible to have a capitalist system uh, that's fair and representative uh, and equitable. Um, the question of equality is a tax question; it's an economic question. It's not necessarily a, a mode of production or or, uh, or 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 political question. I just think that capitalism has proven to be um, a better system for growth, establishing that tax base, and then thusly being compatible with a democratic framework so that you can actually get those programs passed because, um, you know, for all the one-off stories of, oh, the conservatives in the UK are thinking about cutting the NHS or conservatives in the in Canada are talking about, you know, getting rid of welfare or, you know, universal credit and stuff like that. Um, the truth is the trend over time is that all of these countries have moved uh, to more and more redistributive programs as the countries have become richer. Um, there's been more money to redistribute. Uh, and uh, and go from there. You know, you can have a system, ironically, with uh, billionaires that do have outsized influence, but ultimately the outsized influence doesn't seem to overtake the overwhelming uh, influence of the people uh, and and uh, and what they want. Uh, I think that some people would consider what I've just said naive, but it's just an empirical fact that the economies have become more and more controlled by the broad voting populace than uh, capital owners over time. So basically what you're saying is that when we look to like, I assume you're talking about the Nordic countries and more social democratic countries that their ability to, I guess, redistribute wealth more effectively is kind of nullified or at least, you know, dampered the sort of economic power that capital owners have. Is that correct? Well, really? I think, I think uh, to add one thing onto that, that's very important. This is a trend that's been seen across virtually every country. 
So, I mean, if you look at almost every country in the global north, if you look from 1900 or like whenever the country is founded to today, a way higher percentage of the economy is redistributed by the government um, in a democratic, uh, under, under a democratic framework. So I, I think um, that, that to me shows that there's uh, quite an example of, uh, of, of, uh, of, you know, essentially of the economy being more controlled by the people, but also the fact that if you look, uh, if you bisect it and look at just social spending, you know, things on like, you know, welfare and uh, healthcare spending and, uh, you know, unemployment and social security stuff, you know, that percentage has gone up precipitously across the developed world as well. So I think okay. um, people spending as well has gone up quite a bit. Okay, well, I, I can't speak to the data because I haven't looked at that specifically. Um, but I'll say this. Um, I don't think necessarily that redistributing wealth for wealth for like welfare programs and that sort of stuff doesn't take away from the power that capital actually holds. Um, it certainly scares capital. It certainly scares owners, right? Because they're going to have to pay more. But ultimately, this doesn't actually address the issue that ultimately speaking, owners still have more power in a liberal democracy, a capitalist society. The in nature a that you sense, know, you're saying. In an economic sense as well. Yes, both. Um, it it Because essentially... What I'm getting at is this. By nature, that capital has the kind of power that it has in any society that is capitalist. This includes the Nordic model as well. Sure. They will have more influence than the average worker. And that means their voices will be heard more often. And when that doesn't go their way, they have no problems with potentially overthrowing the government as evidenced by the business plot back in the... I think it was the 1930s and you're in the United States where they attempted to basically overthrow FDR um, through a sort of, I guess you say like semi-fascist coup or what have you. So capital's interest is always going to be disaligned with the average person, the average worker, because they have just different interests. They care about their own class interests more than they care about um, the sanctity or the sort of longevity of any kind of democratic institution. Well, sure, but I think you know who else cares about their class interest is labor, right? And that's why throughout time, labor has been able to vote in many, many uh, you know democratic and redistributive uh, reforms. Now, I don't agree mm -hmm. that owners have an outsized influence uh, in the economy in the sense that uh, owners, you know, they, I mean, they're owners for a reason. They made the initial investments, and that's those are their companies, and so I think it's okay. pretty fair and reasonable for them to have. Uh, amount of influence now i still believe in things like uh parity on worker boards unionization representation uh, even third party union representation uh in the most uh for the most part um which i think would solve a lot of those internal disputes that you're you might be uh you, you know not favorable to between workers and capital but uh that's possible in a capitalist framework right and again what is uh, true on the political side is that it's proven. We, we've we seen it happen across many, many, many different nations that uh, you can have uh, a stable uh, democratic system uh, with the presence of capital in that system. You know, I think uh, when you look at uh, Switzerland or the UK or uh, Norway or even the United States that gets a lot of flack for the influence of money in our politics, uh, you tend to see uh, a, you know, a, a fairly representative government uh depending on the actual structure of the government the u.s has a uh obviously a kind of a weird sort of uh way that we elect our president but um you know in other countries that have a more majoritarian system you, you don't really tend to see the uh this in this incredible outsized influence of capital uh again it seems quite amicable well, i mean for, for goodness sakes the plot that you're talking about failed it didn't work right because our institutions are very strong uh well, there was a there was a well really quick there was a similar plot in the uk against Harold Wilson, uh, a premiership. Um, and that also failed because the institutions in the UK are so strong, institutions that were built on the back of liberal democracy under a capitalist framework. Yeah, so the business plot didn't necessarily fail because the institutions were strong enough. It failed because one of the, the main people who was going to lead the coup decided to reveal the plot to the institutions who could then combat it. It wasn't that the institutions in and of themselves were so strong that they withstood the plot. It's that someone turned them in, essentially. That's what happened. Um, speaking to the other points, um, I'll speak more broadly, I guess, um, with my problems with social democracy, because I think that's, gonna, that's really what we're talking about here. So while I agree 
that worker workers on board decisions is preferable and these sorts of um, reforms are good. My point is that one, simply allowing someone at the seat of the table doesn't mean they actually are ruling the table. You know, so long as capital has this relationship, workers, while they might be given more representation, are not given the same equal footing. And so certain decisions are going to come before theirs. This is where we talk about class interest again. But also more broadly, when it comes to social democracy, you know, my point is that it's not a sustainable model, as I'm going back to earlier. So when we talk about, you know, creating these more equal outcomes and such, these aren't, these, these can't withstand capital's interests because, I mean, we can just look back to America again, because, you know, that's what's most relevant to us. You know, FDR, you know, implemented his great, you know, you know, the New Deal and had all these great programs, you know, like Social Security, you know, bringing about these sorts of programs. But what we've seen is that, you know, capital interests, you know, private interests, um, and I guess also reactionary forces came together over 50, 60 years to undermine those programs and bring them about to what we have today. So while we are able to create these more equitable and fair sort of programs, they're not sustainable because so long as capital exists, it's going to seek to get rid of them because they don't like them because they're a th potential threat to their own interests. So, and I think we can even see this to some of the early stages of this in the Nordic model. You know, if we look to some of the trends they have been going through, you know, some of the ways they view their welfare system, you know, I think they've started to cut it off for more like some of the refugees that have come there. So they started to engage in more sort of welfare chauvinism. Um, so we're starting to see some of the early stages where you're starting to see these more reactionary forces and these more private interests superseding, you know, the democratic values, these sort of social democratic values that these countries are built on. So my point is that, you know, while these programs are preferable and better than what we have now, I don't think they can sustain themselves. And ultimately, they don't actually address the main problem, which is this unequal relationship, this sort of um, dominant subordinate relationship that capital has with workers. Well, again, I, I don't think, uh, I don't, I don't know if socialism doesn't get rid of the you know, boss worker relationship. It just relabels it. I, I don't think that socialism addresses those well, things either. We'll, just, we'll have to agree to disagree on that then, because that that's just antithetical to everything I believe. Well, but I mean, do you think? Well, for instance, do you think the fact that we vote for president means that the president, like, how do I put this? Like, we vote for a president. It's democratically decided. Technically, he works for us. But would you say that the relationship between an average citizen and the president is equal? Well, I would argue no, because there's obviously a lot of separation between who eventually gets voted in as president and the people that voted them in, because there has to be, right? I mean, I, I, that, that would be my argument between um, that there has to be some necessary hierarchy to, to, to socialist systems, but that's obviously beside the fact it's all entirely theoretical, um, be, because it has to be, because socialism has, has not been proven to be robustly democratic but ex except for our well he was an interesting example they have a really interesting uh electoral system but i wouldn't call them democratic but in general i would say that um i you know i don't know how long a system has to be around for you to call it sustainable um i mean for instance the nhs in england is i think like 80 years old or something like that it's been going around uh, for quite a long time the healthcare systems of many countries across the world are 50 60 70 80 years old in a decommodified sense, um, you know, there, there's a lot of systems in place that are not explicitly not private that would be better for capital owners if they were private that do not get privatized. You know, you look at, uh, you know, fire, fire services, um, you know, police, uh, the military, stuff like that, that isn't privatized. Um, you look at many, many different social welfare programs. Every Almost every developed country has a social security program that would be better if it was privatized. But um you know, even the the big evil capitalist United States hasn't privatized their social security system. So, and, and that's been around for almost a hundred years. So, I, I I just you know I, I'm not sure how you would define what is sustainable and not sustainable. What I would say is that socialism's been tried for a hundred years, and it's failed for a hundred years. So I you know, but you're arguing for socialism. I'm arguing for the system that has been proven to create strong institutions and uh, develop them over time. Whereas you're arguing for the system that uh, has been unstable for a hundred years. Okay, so to address this 
point about the president being separate from the people. I think you're uh... people's interest in acting different now. Um, I agree that there's difference between the president and the average person um, when they're voted sure. in. But the point being is, I don't. I'm not sitting here saying that hierarchy is going to be completely abolished under socialism. The point being is that we give workers direct say and direct control over their lives and direct control over and say of who. May hierarchy there, there's some differences. Ultimately, theoretically, maybe not always in practice, the president is going to be you know, subservient to the will of the people. They are going to listen to what their constituents want and they'll do as they say, supposedly. So when we talk about this and we apply this relationship to socialism, worker, democracy, whatever you want to call it, it still stands. You know, you can say that it's just relabeled, but like it's a relabeled version of boss and workers. But if the boss is, you know, subservient or they have to, you know, listen to what their workers actually have to say. I don't think that's the same at all, just as it wouldn't be the same to say, oh, we have a leader who's a dictator and we have workers. It's the same as a president. It just relabeled. Like, that's not a fair assessment because there's very clearly different factors going into it. It's a very different relationship in and of itself. Um, going to your second point, I think you're talking about, um, you know, what would count as a sustainable program, what would count as a sustainable system. You're talking about programs like um, are you asking me like what would how long does it take for something to be sustainable or good uh, you brought up the example of like i believe the nhs um and i think even now the nhs it's not i'm not it's well it's certainly well certainly around it's not like it has just been constant it's been this good thing it's always been funded you know it's gone through moments i'm pretty sure of defunding and i think even under boris johnson they've been seeking to privatize certain sections of it so this actually goes back to my original point when it comes to like what happened after the New Deal, where we saw, you know, the gradual but ultimate privatization of a lot of these programs or the defunding of these programs to the point where capital was more comfortable with them. So, you know, in terms of sustainability, it, once again, this just goes back to my point, which is that so long as capital has the kind of power that it has, it will always act in its own interests that are cont contrary to workers or even just the average person in general, where they will seek to cut these programs, privatize them as best as they can so they don't have to compete or pay for them, that sort of thing. And I forgot what was the last thing you said. Oh, I think you're referring to um sorry, I, I won't I won't say that because I don't I'm not sure what you said from the last point. So if you want to address those or restate what you said, then that's fine. Yeah, no worries. I, I think that you know, I think you've brought up a couple examples that I'm not sure necessarily prove your point. So it's true that certain aspects of the NHS uh, are in talks to be privatized or to have private contractors come in. At the end of the day, the state's still paying people's bills, right? I mean, the, the existence of some private services does not negate the fact that the overwhelming portion of the system is, is still totally decommodified and, you know, totally state run. Um, the NHS is is uh, arguably unique in that regard. They have a, a, a totally state healthcare system. Um, I believe that the Nordic economy is the same. Uh, if you look at Canada, they just have a Medicare style insurance where it's it's just a state who operates an insurance program, but there's a lot of yes. private carriers. But um, I, I don't think that that mm -hmm. disproves my point. You bring up Medicare and Social Security, which were the two biggest parts of the, of the New Deal. Um, those have only grown over time. They they yeah, yeah. they literally have have exploded in terms of how much we've spent on them. The original payroll tax for um uh for social security was uh I think one percent. Well now it's uh, six point two percent. Uh, and Medicare the original tax for that I think was uh, a quarter percent. Or no Medicare I think was uh Medicare I think Medicare was the nineteen sixties. But um anyway th that you know these programs yeah they came grow in the sixties. Yeah, apologies. But that tax has, I think, also like uh, quintupled. I think it started out as a quarter percent and now it's like one and a half percent, one point four five percent matched by the employer. And so, you know, I, these programs have only grown today. They account for, I think it's like two thirds, 60, 70 percent of everything the government spends on today. The U.S. government, almost two thirds of it is just those two programs, which are both entitlement programs, which are both redistributive programs. So I, I think, you know, it's it's a. Uh, 
you know, these things don't prove your point. They, they really serve to prove my point, which fundamentally is just the idea that capitalism is more amicable in terms of its relationship with democracy. At least it's been proven to be that way over time. Um, and I, and again, I, I think that um, I, I don't think you've properly addressed the irony of, of saying that capitalism is unsustainable. Capitalism isn't sustainable. Well, it's been around for a hundred. Uh, well, I, sorry, it, it's been around in its current form broadly for the last hundred years. It's been sustainable. It can build strong institutions. But for the last hundred years of socialism, it, it hasn't been proven to do the same thing. But you're advocating for socialism, not capitalism. So how do you address that uh, sort of what I would label as irony um, in general? Your irony, so the ironic question you're asking me is whether or not, how can I advocate for socialism because it's failed over the last 100, 150, whatever you say years, while capitalism has succeeded over the last hundred years? Is that what you're asking me? You're saying capitalism and its relationship with democracy is unsustainable, but I have, I feel like, fairly decently and robustly proven that over the last hundred years, that has not been the case. Um, that capitalism is amicable in its relationship with democracy. However, the same cannot be said for socialism. The same cannot be said for socialism. So, you know, how do you reconcile that? I don't think you've proven that capitalism is any more better at this than the supposed socialist models you're criticizing like what like i've said before you know when capital is threatened which it has been in the united states which it has been in plenty of other countries it will consolidate and it will seek to overturn and overthrow the government in some ways not always successful granted but it will attempt that which is a sign that it doesn't really care about these democratic institutions which indicates it's an unsustainable, unsustainable, or at least contradictory system with dem democracy. Well, you know, but there's, if we there's that's about the but really, let, model, let Europe, me butt in really quick. Then there's never about oh, yeah, I'll let you. Okay, fine, you go ahead. Well, well, there's never been a successful example of a revolution in a liberal democracy. It's never happened, and so how? What do you mean how? It's just there's never you know. The, the developed, happened. yeah, these developed liberal democracies. There's never been a there's at the point of transitioning to liberal democracy. There's there's never been a successful revolution in any of them. The oldest one is the UK. Um, there's never been a revolution in the UK since the Magna Carta was was signed. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there was only a, a, I think it was like a few months. I think where Cromwell took over, but he was eventually again the institutions kind of came back and. He was eventually executed, but there's you're what, saying what, that what, what do you think a, a revolution is exactly? I guess I'd have to ask you what you think a revolution is. To me, a revolution is you're saying that you know the business class, um, you know, doesn't all it doesn't always work when the business class. That implies that it sometimes worked, but it, to my knowledge, the business class has never overthrown a government in a developed liberal democracy and replaced the, uh, you know, replaced the government essentially. But there have been attempts, which is my point. I'm not saying that every instance has succeeded. The point was the attempt to, and that's intentionality. Okay. You don't care about that, right? Well, I, I would say, I mean, there have been, I'm not sure why I would care about that. I mean, there have been, a, I mean, there, there have been attempts that are gone. I, I just don't think, why, why would I care about the attempts when they've not proven to be successful at, at any turn? I, that doesn't seem to, why would I care, I guess, if that makes any sense. Well, like I'm the sure there's always some crazy billionaire who's wants to overthrow the government, but I mean it, they've never been successful. So I mean, let them. The point that I'm making is that even if something hasn't succeeded, that doesn't mean you should not be concerned with it. And the fact that capital has this tendency to not, you know, be compatible with democracy is a sign that they don't really care about these institutions, and that when their interests are threatened or seriously threatened. They will overturn those institutions that they supposedly care about, right? I mean, I don't think, I don't think it'd be fair to say like, oh, well, the the insurrection on January sixth, it didn't succeed, so who cares? You know, why should I care? Well, the point being is that they attempted to do so, and they have that intentionality to overthrow the government and install their own kind of government, or you know, reinstate the old one, whatever you want to say, and that is incompatible with democracy. That is a threat. And that should be taken seriously. So even if you don't, if it didn't succeed, right, the fact that they are willing to do so and are have that intention is a potential threat. It is something to be concerned with. 
right? That is a sign of something that could be insustainable, unsustainable, right? So I would say that it's not that it's not a concern in the moment. Of course, anytime someone advocates for the overthrow of a government, that is a problem. Um, but what you said originally wasn't true. You know, you said capital has a tendency uh, to be unsustainable in terms of uh, its relationship with democracy. What I have, I think, proven is that's not the case, right? There is, There have been many, many different instances of developed capitalist democracies being fairly robust, fairly representative, high turnout, high interest in elections, um, redistributive in nature, progressive in taxation, um, and able to effectively manage that relationship between capital and, and labor. But you haven't answered the alternative, which is that the relationship that has been proven to exist between socialism and democracy in the last hundred years has been wholly unsustainable. There has not been an example of a uh, you know large sustainable, democratic, socialist government uh, in the last hundred years or, or since socialism's, you know, sort of come into being as a, as a form of thought. Um, you haven't answered that criticism, but I feel like I've properly answered the fact that, no, it's not true. Capital has been amicable to, democ to democracy um, for, I would argue, a sustainable period of time. A hundred years is quite a long time for an institution to develop. Uh, but you haven't answered the criticism that I've levied, which is that socialism and democracy has not proven to be uh, amicable towards each other. It's been proven to be, uh, you know, unfortunately for your case, quite the opposite. Okay. So what I would say then is that, I guess to more directly address your critique, um, yes, it's true that lots of socialist projects that we point to and look at have not been the most democratic or they haven't been most compatible um, in some ways or another with our conception of democracy. What I'll say, though, is that while there have not been many great examples of this, this doesn't, once again, my whole point is that it's more so looking to the horizons and seeking to build something more than what we have. So yes, there have been bad examples. I'm not disputing that. My point has always been, it's not a question of just looking to examples or looking to the past. Those are important and it's important to keep those in mind. But in terms of the critique, for me, it has and always has come down to it's just a matter of a moral principle. You know, it's not just that, you know, when we look to like a Marxist Leninist model, yes, there are problems with it, but what are they getting right in some ways? What are the underlying issues with it? And what can we take away from them? And the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, whatever problems you have with them, and I do have problems with some of the earlier socialist models, ultimately speaking, they're getting at something that's very important, and that is. As long as capital has power in our society the way it does, this is not sustainable with democracy in some ways. Even with the examples that you brought up of Norwegian or just European social democracies, we're not really seeing trends, I think, in some ways that there is some degree of, um, I guess you could say, tension between capital workers, early stages of it. So my point is that we should seek to reconcile those differences in some ways, but for me at least, I don't think that such differences can be reconciled um, with these, at least within the framework of capital. We have to move beyond it in some ways, and thus we have to kind of implement something that is more, um, I guess you could say, in line with our values, more in line with our moral values, while also not returning to the past. So that means creating a system that is more democratic, that is more open, that is more ultimately socialist, but not in the same sense. Socialist in the sense that actually returning power to workers, both in the workplace, but also in the government or so. So it isn't just that we elect certain people to represent us, it's that workers have a direct say over the government more so than before, i.e. something like workers actually running the government in some ways. That's a little far off, I admit, but ultimately speaking, that is what my values, that is what the values of people would lead them to say. Socialism isn't just a couple of bad examples in the past, or many bad examples, if you want to say so. It's about an ideal that we strive for and that we should try to seek in the world. It's just a moral principle. That's ultimately what I'm getting at. That's fair. Uh, to, to finish this off, uh, B from B for Vendetta did say that uh, in him is more than an idea, and ideas are bulletproof. So I think that uh, you have a strong point in that regard, socialism could be uh, 
you know, who, who, who knows? Maybe with technological advancements, um, um, something resembling socialism could be more sustainable in the future. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't know if that would be possible. I don't know if I agree to that, but um, uh, I, I guess my overall, my final point would be that I think that uh, if your values, as you originally said, are, are freedom, you know, individual liberty, uh, you know, life that is free from coercion, I think that a capitalist framework uh, can bring uh, the individual and the collective closer to that uh, sort of theoretical construct that is free from coercion than than a uh, than a socialist framework could, um, in my opinion.